Okay, good morning. Oh, that was an exercise in loneliness. Good morning. All right. It's, a, it's actually afternoon, though, huh? It's afternoon now. How was church this morning? Rate our Pastor Gene on a 1 to 10. Yeah. I know. It's just awesome worshiping together here at Eastside. And my name is Greg Curtis, and I am um, on the Bill community team here. And my passion and my ministry is helping people connect with our community here at Eastside and take their first steps here. So I'm glad you're at First Step with Gene. It's not First Step with Greg, so you didn't come here to hear me. You came to hear from our guest of honor, Gene. Give him a big hand. Well, hi, everybody, and uh, I am so glad you're here today. And uh, one of my favorite parts of my role at Eastside is to get to be a part of First Step here. And uh, I'm always amazed with the number of new people that God keeps bringing around Eastside and uh, the fact that you'd hang out for a little bit. Uh, of spend part of your weekend here today uh, with me means a lot, and I thought we could get started. I, did, I just kind of want to do a little survey in the room on something. Show of hands, how many of you would say that you've been at Eastside for four weeks or less? Four weeks or less. Wow, that's amazing, isn't it? We're so glad you're here. Let's welcome the four weeks or less crowd. How many would say it's been like maybe four weeks to three months, somewhere in there? Wow, another significant... How many uh, you've come to Eastside uh, since we moved here in this campus, November of 2013? Yeah, 2012. And uh, to now, how many in that category? Another good category in that, yeah. How many ever here because you heard there was free pizza today? And <laughs> that's the, yeah, I, I figured that. Uh, I've been at Eastside, I've been the, the pastor at Eastside since October of 2008, and uh, they were looking for a pastor that was sounded like he'd been inhaling helium, and I got the job. <laughs> and uh, what, I, what I'd like to do today is tell you a little bit about, uh, start with my story a little bit, how I ended up at Eastside as the pastor here. But actually, this is my second time to end up at Eastside, and so I want to tell you how I ended up here the first time and how I ended up here uh, the second time. Uh, I grew up in the central part of the United States. I grew up in central Illinois. And I uh, grew up in a family where uh, my mom and dad uh, decided early on that they were going to keep their family small in order to give their kids lots of opportunity. And so they stopped after six children. And uh, I was number six. And uh, actually, they had stopped after number five. And they got rid of the high chair and the crib and all that kind of stuff. And uh, f five years later, you know, they got this uh, bonus baby in their life. You know, they call that the mistake. I told them it was the unexpected blessing that came into their life. And uh, so I'm the youngest of six kids. And I know this has not been the experience for a lot of you in this room. And, and uh, we all come from different kinds of families and backgrounds. But I grew up in a family with a mom and dad that marked my life in incredibly positive ways. And I thank God for that. And and uh, I'm, I'm grateful for that. In fact, my dad was a pastor. And uh, any other pastor's kids in the room today? Yeah, I'm the only one, right? And uh, so sometimes that's a good thing. Sometimes that's a bad thing for people. If you've known some pastor's kids growing up, sometimes they kind of react against that or rebel against that. And uh, I, I never did because my dad was the real deal, the same guy at home as he was in public. And uh, just really marked my life in, in good ways. A lot of children, this is a true story, a lot of children, you know, grow up playing house or they grow up playing doctor, nurse, or something like that. We grew up at our house playing church, believe it or not. I, I had three older sisters, and they would get in the living room. They'd do a little worship team, you know, and a little worship time. And one of my brothers would say a prayer, and I'd give a message. And then we'd hit mom or dad four or five times with the offering plate. Uh, <laughs> before they realized what was going on. It was a very profitable experience for us uh, growing up. Uh, but that was the home uh, that I grew up in. And my dad never made a great deal of money, but he was very generous and always made sacrifices uh, for his kids. And one of the sacrifices that he made over the years, and that if you're around East Side at all, you'll hear me talk about from time to time, is... Uh, we have a family cabin on a lake in northern Minnesota where I still go every year. And the way that that kind of tradition started in our family was back in the 1950s. This is before I was born. 
my dad got together with two other financially challenged pastors and they pooled their resources and they bought they bought two lakefront lots on this beautiful lake in northern Minnesota for $250 a piece is what they paid for the lot. It was a pretty good investment, actually. And then they were so poor they couldn't afford to build much of a cabin, and they bought for $500 what was called a cabin kit. And uh, they were so poor, this is true, I'm not making this up, they couldn't afford a level when they built that cabin. And to be honest with you, that old cabin looks like it was built by three pastors who couldn't afford a level when they built it. <laughs> And uh, the wiring was so primitive in that cabin that you couldn't run an electric skillet and an iron at the same time, or you'd blow a fuse. And uh, the only running water we had was when, like, mom or dad would yell water, and one of his kids would run out back to the well where we would have to hand pump the water and bring it in. And then the only bathroom that we had was an outhouse about 50, 100 feet behind the cabin. Anybody know what an outhouse is? You know, these holes in the ground with the building on it that became your bathroom. And one of the things I never understood about the outhouse is why it was a two-seater. <laughs> because no two people I know would ever want to be in there, <laughs> you know, at the same time together. And, uh, but in spite of uh, all of its imperfections, when I think of my greatest childhood memories, that's the place that I think of. And uh, that's where I'd have my dad, you know, to myself for a few weeks. And uh, he taught me to water ski and to swim and to fish and to canoe and to drive boats. And we would have, uh, at night, we had this fireplace, and we'd often gather around the fireplace at night and roast marshmallows. And we would have prayer as a family, and we'd have uh, devotions as a family where we'd read the Bible and talk about that a little bit. So it was just a fantastic experience. And when I was 14 years old, I'd been out fishing with my dad one day up in northern Minnesota and also with my grandfather, and we came back. Dad wasn't feeling well, and uh, wasn't feeling so well that night. We had to take him to the local hospital, a little, little town of just over 2,000 people in Park Rapids, Minnesota, so you can imagine what the hospital was like, and found out that Dad had had a massive heart attack. And uh, his condition worsened to the point that... Um, Four days later, it became necessary to transport him from that little tiny hospital in Park Rapids, Minnesota, to the big hospital 90 miles away in Fargo, North Dakota. And so the family all went to wait for the ambulance to arrive uh, with Dad. And my brother Mike and I went back to our family cabin to pack some things, and then we were all going to join the rest of the family. And so we're back packing, and we see this familiar car drive up the road, and it's my dad's best friend. And he gets out, and uh, I'll never forget it. He put one arm around me just like this, and he put one arm around my brother Mike just like this. And he said, boys, I've got some good news and some bad news for you today. He said, the good news is your daddy's gone to heaven today. And he said, the bad news is he isn't with us any longer. And just like that, my life changed. And many of you, you know what it's like when there's a circumstance in your life where just like that, everything changes. And uh, while I had grown up in a Christian home and I'd put my faith in Jesus at a young age, this was like the first real test that I had ever had of my faith, you know, where I had to figure out, do I really believe this stuff? Is this, you know, do I have the real deal? Or have I just kind of been coasting on the coattails of my family? And a few hours after Dad died, we're all packing. We're getting ready to drive back. We lived 700 miles away in the state of Illinois, so we're getting ready to go back to prepare for his funeral, et cetera. And uh, my mom asked me if I would go down the road about a half mile from our cabin. There was a little convenience store where over the course of a summer we'd buy newspapers and milk and coffee and things like that, and they would just keep a tab. You know, this was back in the old days. They would keep a tab. And then uh, at the end of the summer we'd just go pay off the tab. And so uh, mom asked me if I would go pay that off. And I said, sure. So she gives me a wad of cash. And I'm walking down this gravel road about a half mile from our cabin. And everything about my life, I feel like, got defined that day on that walk down that road. And uh, I remember everything about it in vivid detail. I remember the tall pine trees on each side of the road. I remember what I was wearing. I had on a pair of plaid bell bottoms with cuffs about that big. <laughs> and uh, a maroon-colored T-shirt. I may have only been 14 years old, but I had a pretty good fashion sense about <laughs> myself, you know. And uh, I've not had a lot of experiences in my life where I felt God just spoke to me, but I felt God spoke to me that day. 
And I was walking down the road. Here's what I sensed God saying to me was, Gene, what happened to your dad today is going to happen to every single person on the face of the earth. One day is going to be their last day. And there's only one thing that matters on that last day, and that is, do they know my son, Jesus Christ? Do they have a relationship with him? And, and I sense God saying, you know, fortunately, my dad had that relationship with God. Got, my dad had that relationship with Jesus Christ. But I sense God saying, Gene, if you'll put your hand in my hand, if you'll trust me, I'm going to use your life to help people get ready for their last day. And so, like, if you want to know what Gene Apple is about, that's, a, it, that's about as, as good of a picture as I can give you, is that since that day, my life got redirected, and my whole life has been about helping people get ready for their last day and to live every day between now and then in God's grace and God's power in their life. And uh, so I was 14 years old when all that happened. Two weeks later, I preached my first sermon. It was five minutes long. People are still saying, bring back the old days, Gene. Bring back the old days. <laughs> and uh, it was entitled Sharing Christ with Others. And I think that's what I'm trying, trying to do all these years later is I've been trying to share Christ with others. In fact, I love, would have loved that on my tombstone one day as my epitaph, you know, sharing Christ with others, that that's what my life was all about. So uh, kind of speed up the story a little bit. Uh, Four years later, I graduate from high school, and I go to a fantastic Christian college and seminary, and part of my training was to do an internship at a church. And, and this is a school back in Illinois. And, in, in, and when I was 20 years old, I had the privilege of coming to Eastside Christian Church here in Southern California to be an intern at this church. This is way back in 1920. <laughs> and... Uh, <laughs> I had never been to California before, and that summer I was driving across the country uh, to get out here, and uh, I stopped in Las Vegas. I'd, I'd never been to Las Vegas before, and uh, uh, I spent the night with some family friends that we had that lived in Las Vegas, and we went out to eat. Remember, we went to a Mexican restaurant, and they were telling me about their church and all the different things that God was doing, and I was just like, wow, that would be something. Wouldn't it be something to serve a church and be a pastor in Las Vegas someday? And little did I know that five years later, exactly five years later, I would become the pastor of their church in Las Vegas. But before I get that far, so I come to Eastside that summer. I was 20 years old. I had an unbelievable experience. This church was rocking, and people were finding faith and growing in faith. And they had a pastor in those days. He was the pastor of this church for 22 years. His name was Ben Merrill. And I had the privilege. I, I was on an internship for seven months. I lived with Ben and his wife, Pat, for half of that internship. And so I got to know them well. I got to see their life up close and personal, and they built into me in so many ways. In fact, I was recently with Ben and Pat. They're 85 and 86 years old now. They're doing great. And uh, I said to Ben, I said, Ben, I said, you know, one of the things I remember most about when I was living with you and Pat, he said, every time you would walk up behind her, you would pat her on the butt. And she jumped in and she goes, oh, he still does. <laughs> 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 and I love that. So I've been trying to follow my mentor. I pat my <laughs> wife's butt every, every chance I get. So I had a fantastic experience at Eastside that summer, and five years later, I ended up the pastor of a church in Las Vegas. I was 25 years old. I could barely shave, and uh, I mean, I wondered, you know, what is church going to be like in Las Vegas? Are they going to have an Elvis impersonator doing the prelude, you know? Are you going to have girls in bikinis announcing hymn numbers, you know, like... Uh, you know, you're going to have tithe machines in the church lobby. What's that going to be like? And uh, I spent the next 18 years of my life in Las Vegas and had an unbelievable experience. And I watched this little church of 400 people grow to over 8,000 people. And we planted a couple daughter churches that are thriving. One of those churches today is running over 6,000 people in attendance and another one over 4,000 people in attendance. And and I just saw God do miraculous things and was so privileged to be a part of that. And after 18 years in Las Vegas in 2003, I got invited by a friend of mine, Bill Hybels, who's pastor of one of the largest churches in the United States at Willow Creek Community Church in Chicago, to go and be a part 
of that church and, and Bill wanted me to help with some of the challenges that they were facing there. In fact, I met a girl right over here who grew up in that church today and is in Southern California now. She thought she had escaped me. But, uh, and uh, so I spent five years there. It was a great experience, but I just felt like I wasn't in the center of my calling of what God wanted me to do with my life. And I felt like fundamentally God had wired me to be the senior pastor of a local church. So back in uh, early 2008, my wife Barbara and I made the decision to leave that church and to move toward a senior pastor role somewhere. But uh, we made that decision not knowing where we were going. We were asking God to lead us. And uh, so over the course of the next four or five months, we considered a number of different opportunities, prayed about them, and finally had reached a point where I thought, I thought God was opening a door and calling me to go to a church in St. Louis. And, uh, in fact, we'd made several trips there, and we even got down to where we made the house hunting trip there, and I said, I'm going to come. I, I, I said, I'm going to come. And then I said, you know, before we final all of the, finalize all of this, though, I want to take one more week, and I want to pray about this. And uh, so a week went by, and I remember it was a Monday, and I don't know how else to say this, but I just was not at peace with the decision. And it just, you know, I didn't know if I'd had, like, bad pizza the night before or something, you know, or just, well, but I was not at peace, and I called him that Monday afternoon, and I said, I don't know why I'm saying this, and I don't know what I'm going to do, and this is how I said it to him, but I just cannot say yes. I cannot say yes. And I hung up the phone thinking, well, that was probably the dumbest decision you've ever made in your life, Gene, because I didn't know what I was going to do. This was late June of 2008. Exactly, I'm not making this up, exactly one hour later, I get a text message on my phone, and it said, confidential, Southern California opportunity, call me. <laughs> so I called, and it was a friend of mine who lived here in Southern California who had been uh, good friends with the former senior pastor of Eastside. Uh, after Ben Merrill was here, there was a pastor here named Graydon Jessup for the next 17 years, great godly man. And Graydon, at age 67, decided that it was probably time for him to make a transition and retire in his life. And Graydon had asked this mutual friend that we had to contact me to see if I would have any openness to considering coming to Eastside to be the next senior pastor of this church. And when he said Eastside, my heart skipped a beat, and I knew why I had said no an hour earlier, and I didn't know at the time, and I just felt like God had called me here, and to be able to come here and be a part of the next chapter of Eastside was very exciting to me, and I love Southern California and felt a geographic call here. I mean, the whole world is in Southern California. Los Angeles Basin, we speak over 200 languages in the Los Angeles Basin. I mean, the whole world is here, and... Uh, so that's how I ended up here the first time, and that's how I ended up here the second time. And uh, to tell you just a little bit, that's a little bit about my story. The East Side story began in 1962, and it began meeting, the church began meeting in a warehouse in Fullerton. And then a few years later, they bought property at the corner of State College Boulevard in Yorba Linda in Fullerton, which is right across the street from Cal State Fullerton. And that's where Eastside spent most of its first 50 years, well, its first 50 years until it moved here in November of 2012 to this property. And you say, well, how, how, did, how did all that happen? Well, let me tell you a little bit about that journey. When I arrived at Eastside, uh, got all the key leaders in the church together and staff members, and we started praying this prayer. And the prayer that we prayed was, God, what do you want Eastside to look like by the year 2012? You say, why would you pray a prayer like that? Why 2012? What was significant about that year? We knew that would be Eastside's 50th anniversary year. And I don't know, you know, what you all know about the dynamics of the life cycle of typical churches and things, but typically when a church turns 50, most churches have had their best days already. Most churches, when they turn 50, are kind of looking back at the past, remembering the good old days is better than they really were. They're really not looking ahead. Now, there are certainly exceptions to that. And we decided we wanted to be one of those exceptions. And we started praying, God, what do you want Eastside to look like by the year 2012, by our 50th anniversary year? Because wouldn't it be something if when we turn 50, we're taking our greatest steps forward that we've ever taken as a church, where we're taking our greatest risk, and we believe that our greatest days are still ahead of us. 
And so we started praying, what do you want Eastside to look like? And we felt God leading us not to, to do something new, but really something very old, to re recapture the dynamics of the first church that we read about in the New Testament of the Bible. And it came down to three things. We felt God saying, I want you to be a church where people pursue me, where people pursue God, just like that early church where they were devoted to him and they worshiped and they pursued him. Whether they're searching for God, finding God, moving forward in their faith, I want you to be a church where people pursue me. Second, I want you to be a church where people build community, where they, where they build relationships and connection. We read in Acts 2 of the early church, they met from house to house in small groups, and, and they kind of became all these clusters of little churches, where they be kind of became the church to each other and loved each other and cared for each other and met one another's needs. And then the third value that we sense God leading us to was I want you to be a church that unleashes compassion. To be like that first church, we read in Acts 2 that they would actually sell some of their possessions in order to meet the needs of one another. And by the time you get to Acts chapter 4, we find that there were no needy persons among them. And so we sense God saying, I want you to be a church like this, where people pursue me, where people build community, where people unleash compassion. And so we decided that's what we wanted to be. And we started moving toward that. Then we had to think about, okay, what's going to be the expression of these values? Because there's a hundred different ways, a thousand different ways that you could pursue God. But we decided our primary expression of the pursue God value would be our weekend services, where we want to help people take next steps wherever they are in their spiritual journey so that they can pursue him. So that's, you know, you just, many of you just came out of a weekend service. And then we decided that build community expression, that we were going to have connection groups. And just like that early church, they would meet from house to house, and they would be a place where people connect, where they belong and grow and serve. And then we decided with the unleash compassion value that we'd express it in three ways, that we'd do it next door, that we would teach people to love their neighbors. Jesus said, love your neighbors, that we would express compassion in the communities that we're a part of, and that we would unleash compassion to some of the global parts of this world. And so we started moving toward this vision, and God started blessing it, and people started coming to faith, and the church grew and grew and grew, and we outgrew our campus in Fullerton, and we were like, what are we going to do? And I wish I had time to tell you all the miraculous stories, and I mean miracle stories, of how we ended up on this former Boeing aerospace site here in Anaheim. But we developed a vision, and our vision to come here was never about a campus. It was never about a building. It was always about people. And we developed what we called our Go Beyond Vision. And our Go Beyond Vision just took those values of pursue God, build community, and unleash compassion, and put, put some feet to them. And we said, we're going to make it a goal in our future to reach 1% of the people who live within 20 miles of our campus. Do you know there are 5.6 million people who live within 20 miles of where we are right now? 5.6 million. Can't even get your head. Three and a half million have no faith connection. They're not Buddhist, Baptist, you know, whatever. They're, they're not connected to any faith community at all. And we said, we're going to reach 1% of them. Anybody know what 1% of 5.6 million is? Any of you mathematicians in the room? 56,000. Ding, 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 ding. Prize, extra piece of pizza for her. <laughs> and uh, yeah, that's 56,000 people. You say, well, that's crazy thinking, Gene. That's what our vision is as a church. And when I moved to Las Vegas, I told you I moved there in 1985. This was my dream and prayer when I moved to Las Vegas that we, we would reach 1% of the population. And today, the church that I served in Las Vegas and the two daughter churches that we planted combined, they reach 30,000 people in their services every weekend, and they reach 2% of the population of Las Vegas, just three churches. So I've seen this happen in my lifetime, and I'm praying it's going to happen again. And then because we're committed to this value of build community, our go beyond vision is to bring the presence of Jesus into every neighborhood by putting connection groups in every neighborhood within 20 miles of this church. And then we had a go beyond vision to unleash compassion. We said we want to triple our compassion efforts in our first five years on this new campus. The number of people serving, like you heard today about the serve day coming uh, March 22nd, number of people serving in our communities globally and in the dollars that we invest. And so this has been our go beyond vision to reach 1%, to bring the presence of Jesus into every neighborhood and to triple our compassion efforts in the next five years. And I want you to know this is kind of what Eastside is about. 
And if you're saying, if you're thinking about making this your church home and coming here, you say, what's this church all about? It's very simple. We pursue God, we build community, and we unleash compassion. And we don't do a thousand other things that are good things that we could be doing. A few of you might come from other church backgrounds where you had like this spiritual buffet of a hundred different programs in your church that you could pick and choose from. We don't do a hundred different programs at Eastside. We pursue God in weekend services. We build community and connection groups where people belong, grow, and serve. And we unleash compassion next door in our community and around the world. And I want to I just want you to know that we have a very simple model of ministry, and I think one of the reasons God has blessed this church so much is we are so laser focused on these things that that's what what we're all about. And uh, so like a year ago, in Compassion, uh, Eastside gave away one point five million dollars in Compassion efforts uh, last year. (laughs) This year, we've given away two point two million dollars in Compassion efforts outside of ourselves. Our goal is when we hit that five-year mark that we're going to be giving away four and a half to five million dollars a year in compassion efforts. We're, but we're also serving. And so we're trying to mobilize over 2,000 people for this serve day. We do those a couple times a day locally in our communities. And we have six global compassion trips this year where we'll have hundreds of people traveling to Kenya, to Chile, to Thailand, to Mexico. And uh, I just want you to know we've made it a goal. If you choose to make Eastside your church home, we've made it a goal to challenge every able-bodied Eastsider, everybody who's physically able to go on a global compassion trip sometime in the next five years. You say, that's crazy. Why would I ever do that? I'm telling you, if you're here, we're coming after you on this one, okay? We're coming after you. So this gives you a little bit. You've heard my story. You've heard a little bit of the Eastside story. I want to talk to you a little bit about your story now, okay? And uh, I want to bring a line up on the board here, and I want you to think about this line here as kind of your life. It's got a first day. It's going to have a last day. I told you my goal in life is to help people get ready for their last day. But think about this kind of in terms of your spiritual journey. And somewhere in the course of your life, somewhere in the course of your spiritual journey, you're going to encounter the message of the cross of Jesus Christ and God's Son who came and gave his life for you. And my guess is uh, we're at all kind of different places in our spiritual journey right now. But if I were to define where different people are in the journey right now, you'd fall into one of four categories. Some of you are what we might call you're in the exploring phase. You're investigating, you're seeking, you're asking questions. Uh, You wonder, could Christianity be true? Really, is Jesus the Son of God? You're in the exploring phase. And I want you to know if that's you. I am so glad you're here. You couldn't be in a better church for you to do your exploration and your uh, seeking because your questions are welcome here. Your doubts are welcome here. Your skepticism is welcome here. We want to help you in this phase. Others of you, you've done your exploring. You came to a decision where you put your faith in Jesus Christ, and you would be maybe what we'd call a new believer. You're taking your early steps in your journey. It's new to you. Or maybe you've been a believer for a while, and you would just be what we call a growing Christian. And if you're, if you're a growing Christian in that category like me, you know that sometimes your growth is up, and sometimes it's down. And sometimes it's up, and sometimes it's down. And, and that's my life there. Or maybe you've been a follower of Jesus for long enough that you are just fully devoted, and you're fully yielded to him in every area of your life, and, and that, that that's very important to you. So here's what I want you to do for a minute. I want you to look at that graph and I want you to think just in your mind draw a dot somewhere on there or draw an x somewhere on that line in your mind of where you would put yourself right now okay just take a minute would you be exploring new believer growing fully devoted somewhere on that continuum got that in mind everybody yeah yeah, okay okay you've got that in mind now here's what I want to say to you our hope and prayer as a church our greatest desire is that wherever you put that X on the line right now, we want to help you take a step forward. We don't care where you are right now. Doesn't matter to me if you're over here, you know, just starting your journey or you're way over. Doesn't matter. We want to help you take a next step in your spiritual journey. We want to help you move forward in your spiritual journey. You say, well, how could you do that? How could we help you? I want to share with you some ideas right now of some options that maybe could be next steps for you that could help you take 
steps in your journey at Eastside. I'm going to give you a menu of several options. I don't think you ought to do all of these, okay? I'm asking you to personalize it, individualize it based on where you are right now. Some of you, maybe a good next step for you in your spiritual journey here at Eastside would be to get in one of our connection groups where people belong and grow and serve. We have, how many connection groups we have, Dave? Over 200 connection groups. They primarily meet in neighborhoods, in the communities where you live. And, uh, uh, you know, there's like 8, 10, 12 people, four, five, six people in these groups. And they get together each week and, and they study. Now, many of you would say, oh, that would be intimidating to me I'd to go from this large group meeting to a small group meeting. And I know there's two concerns that you have. Number one, you're concerned. What if there's a bunch of weirdos there like Gene Apple? Right? Okay? So you can be honest about that. The second concern you have is you feel like, oh, that would be so intimidating to go into an environment like that. I don't know enough about the Bible. I don't, I'd, I'd be, can I just let you in on something? 100% of us don't know enough about the Bible, okay? All of us feel that way. We're all in the same boat. And you're worried about, you know, you're going to get into a, a group like that and somebody's going to say, hey, let's turn in our Bibles to second hesitations. And you're going, I don't know where that is, you know. And uh, so we try to take the scare factor out of it for you. And so almost all of our groups are what, are what we call sermon-based small groups. You say, well, what do you mean by sermon-based small groups or sermon-based connection groups? What I mean by that is the subject matter that all of our groups will be unpacking this week are the sermon that you heard the Saturday or Sunday before on the weekend. So like if you were to go into a connection group this week, there would be a discussion about the topic that we just had in the sermon today about Jesus being no ordinary man. And th that would be the discussion this week. So you already know before you go there what it's going. You don't have to say, oh, they're going to turn to some obscure passage. And I'm not. No, no, no. It's, you're going to know exactly what it's about. In fact, my wife Barbara and I, we were part of a new group that just started meeting this last Tuesday night. There were 12 of us there. And it was the weirdest thing in the world. So I make these DVDs where uh, I do like a, so people in their groups, they can throw in a DVD. You don't have to teach a group. I, I teach every, all these connection groups on DVD. There's like a 12 minute lesson from Gene to start the group. Okay. So we're in this new connection group last week and I'm sitting on the couch while the 12 of us are watching a DVD of me <laughs> teaching this. It was the weirdest thing in the world. I'm just <laughs> telling you right now. But, uh, normally, you know, I'm not sitting there in most of your groups. So, uh, that may be a great next step for some of you to consider. Another great next step for some of you that you know, life, you know, sometimes you hit a speed bump in life. You hit a heartbreak in life. You hit a challenge in life. You hit a hurt in life. And that's why have, we have a ministry called Friday Night of Hope. And Friday Night of Hope is a fantastic community of hundreds of people that gather on our campus on Friday nights. And we have different ministries there. We have this ministry called Celebrate Recovery, which is a Christian-based 12-step group. And it's for people dealing with codependency issues, people dealing with addiction issues, people dealing with anger issues, uh, maybe it's sexual issues, maybe it's chemical issues, maybe it's alcohol issues, all kinds of different things. And hundreds of people at Eastside have found a future and a hope because of the ministry of Celebrate Recovery. Others maybe have gone through a divorce or a marriage breakdown, and you wonder how, how you're going to process that, and we have a fantastic divorce care ministry others have you know you've uh had a loss in your life I, I talked to a mother this morning whose son was killed uh, two years ago this month by a drunk driver and, and dealing with the loss and the pain of that and so we have grief share to help people move beyond that we have a cancer support group and our friday night of hope ministries are led by greg arbwez is greg in the room it's outside oh there he is stand up greg Greg, our Hawaiian, everybody say aloha to Greg. <laughs> and I uh, want to tell you, if you'd like to know more about our uh, Friday Night of Hope Ministries, Greg will be here afterwards today and be glad to answer your questions. Uh, tell you a little bit about Greg's story, and I do it with his permission. Three and a half years ago, he walked into Eastside for the first time, and he was a broken man. His wife had just left him, and he didn't know what he was going to do, and he really didn't have his own personal relationship with God at the time and he was broken and uh, his in-laws of all people invited him to Eastside and uh, he heard this nasally voiced pastor talking that day 
in fact, if I remember right, I think I was teaching that day on the three parables that I talked about today, the lost coin, the lost sheep, and the lost son. And uh, Greg, in the weeks ahead, found a genuine relationship with Christ, and he got became a part of the Friday Night of Hope ministry. And over the course of time, not overnight, doesn't happen overnight, but over time he found healing and he found hope and God put his broken world back together again. And today he's the leader of our Friday Night of Hope. And I say he's the poster child for Friday Night of Hope ministry right there. So uh, Greg's a great one to know. And I, I forget Dave Higgins back. Stand up, Dave. Dave's our executive uh, director of our Build Community Ministries. If you want to know about how to get in a connection group, he's here today. He's an excellent one to talk to about that. Now, another way, you, you could do a connection group. You could do Friday Night of Hope. Another way that some of you might want to consider is becoming a volunteer at Eastside and serving in some way. We have 15 or 1,600 volunteers at Eastside. Amazing group of people. It takes three or 400 volunteers just to do our weekend services. And uh, when you become a volunteer, something changes inside of you. Instead of like sitting in the grandstands watching the game go down on the field there, all of a sudden you're one of the players down on the field, and you go from talking about that church that I attend to my church. I'm a part of it. You say, how would I learn about volunteer opportunities around here? We do a tour that we call our all-access tour. And it's a behind-the-scenes tour. It takes place. We have a Saturday night version of this. We have a Sunday morning version of this. And it takes place uh, where you can go and you can see all kinds of things in all areas of our campus and learn about ways that you, you didn't even know went on at, at Eastside that happened there. And Julie Leem is our director of volunteerism. In fact, stand up, Julie, over there. Julie, we'd be glad to tell you about next all-access tour is in April, right? What, what's the date of that? April 6th, okay, so if you want to lock that in your mind, that's a possibility is a next step for you. By the way, Julie, when I was an intern at Eastside, uh, I lived with her family the other half of my internship. She was like this 15-year-old snot-nosed high school girl, you know, <laughs> and uh, so just kind of funny. Yeah, <laughs> she is younger than me, so uh, no doubt about that. Now, uh, so that's a great way. So we talk at Eastside, you know, about taking next steps. We talk about First step, you know, uh, first step with Gene, another opportunity I went to. Next step, sometimes next steps is a connection group or it's serving for you. And we also have big steps that we talk about. A big step for some people might be a global compassion trip. That's a pretty big step. Or it might be what we call our Eastside Institute for Spiritual Growth and Leadership. These are college-level classes that we offer in co cooperation with Hope International University. They're fully accredited. Uh, Eastside Institute meets on Tuesday nights. Charles Stoiku is the director of our Eastside Institute. Charles, where are you? Stand up right there. Charles is in the room. And if you want to know more about that, you can ask him. And uh, that may be down the road for some of you, but if you'd like to learn more about it, uh, Eastside Institute would be a great, great step. Now, if I could wave a wand today, and if I could say, here would be my pastoral wish for every one of you to take a next step in your life. The next step that I wish you would take, I wish every one of you would take, would be what we call our first step experience. You say, well, I thought I was at first step. You are. You're at first step with Gene. But we offer beyond this what we call our first step experience at Eastside. And a new uh, first step experience is beginning next weekend. There's a Saturday night version at 5. There's a Sunday morning version at 930. So it takes place during services. There's children's ministry going on if you need that. And it, and it goes for seven weeks. And some of you just started hyperventilating when I said seven weeks right now, right? Okay. But it's a seven-week experience to help you grow in ways in your faith that you couldn't imagine that you would grow otherwise. And it's led by Greg Curtis, who introduced me today. Stand up, Greg, again, so everybody can see you over there. And Greg's going to come when I'm done today. He's going to tell you more about the first step experience. We just had a graduation today of people who just finished their last seven-week journey. It's fan by the way, Greg was also at Eastside when I was an intern back in the day he was a high school senior when I was here and I know he looks much older than me but <laughs> he's not I used to hang out at their house have so funny to me that here's Greg and Julie sitting over there and I you know knew them years ago and God must have a sense of humor about all that but uh, so Greg's going to tell you all about that in a minute and but I'm really serious about this it it is transformative when people finish the seven week experience first step experience they're sad to see it come to an end they want it to just keep going and going and going 
And for those of you who were hyperventilating a minute ago about this, I just want to remind you that in the course of seven weeks, you have 1,176 hours in your life. And I'm asking you to take a mere seven hours out of that 1,176 hours and invest them in your soul. Invest them in your spiritual development. Invest them in your spiritual journey. Just seven hours out of the course of the next seven weeks. And I, I really hope that you'll think about that. So today you could take a next step in your journey. It might be to, you know, the first step experience. That would be like if I, I wish everybody would do that. It might be to get into a connection group. It might be to get uh, into a volunteer and pursue opportunities like that through the All Access Tour. It might be Eastside Institute. It might be a compassion trip someday. Now, so I want to go back to this line just for a minute. And I talked to all of you about taking a next step. And I want to say just a word before I wrap up here today. I want to take a few minutes, and I want to talk to those of you who are in the exploring phase of your life. And it could be that some of you have been exploring for a while, and you're getting close to putting your faith in Jesus Christ. As I shared today in the message, my favorite picture in Scripture is when this Jesus is telling the story of the prodigal son, and the prodigal comes home, doesn't know what his dad's going to do. And his dad runs out to meet him with open arms and throws his arms around him and hugs him and kisses him and says, my lost son was home. But my lost son is now home. Let's throw a party. Let's celebrate. And I just want you to know, like if you're kind of here, I want you to know God's arms are always open to you. No matter what you've done, no matter what your past, he's ready to receive you in your life. And... Uh, I feel like I couldn't close this time today. I ought to be sued for pasto pastoral malpractice, really, if I didn't give you an opportunity to RSVP to God's love, to RSVP to God's grace. You say, well, what do you mean, RSVP to God's grace? Let me just walk you through what each of those letters could mean for you. One, you could realize your need today. You say, what do you mean, realize your need? Well, the Bible tells us in Romans chapter Three, that all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. And I did a word study on that word all one time, and you know what it means? It means all. It means all of us have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. And it could be today that you recognize, you know what? I've got some mistakes in my life that I'm not proud of. I've got some moral wrongdoing. I've, got, I've hurt some people. I've hurt God. And maybe today you'd realize your need. What does the S stand for? It just means to say you're sorry. The, the fancy Bible word for this is what we call repentance. The Bible talks about repentance in Acts chapter 3. It says repent then and turn to God so that your sins may be wiped out. What does it mean to turn to God? Well, before you turn in God's direction, it's like you're living for yourself. You're living for yourself. You're living for yourself, and you're going in one direction in your life. Repentance means you turn. And you say, God, I'm going to come in your direction, and I'm going to try, you know, and I'm going to, I know I'll keep making mistakes, and I'll do it, but, but I'm trying to, the trajectory of my life, I'm trying to change. I want to come in your direction. So you realize you need, you say you're sorry, and then you verbalize your faith. What does it mean to verbalize your faith? Let me share a fantastic verse with you from Romans 10. It says, if you confess with your mouth Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. If you confess with your mouth Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart, I mean where you believe it, you accept it into your life that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. That's how you respond to God's love. The Bible says it is by grace you are saved through faith, through your faith. And this not of yourselves, it is the gift of God. And you've got to receive it, though. You've got to respond to that. You've got to verbalize your faith. And then once you've done that, once you've come to faith in Jesus, you express it outwardly in a way that you pee, plunge your past. Plunge your past is what the P stands for. And I'm referring there to Christian baptism. And for 2,000 years, when people have come to faith in Jesus Christ, they express their faith in water baptism where people go under the water to identify with the death and the burial of, of Jesus Christ. And then they're raised up out of the water to identify with his resurrection and the new life that he's given. We had a baptism service a couple weeks ago. By the way, anybody baptized a couple weeks ago in that? A few of you in the room, congratulations on that. 125 people were baptized that weekend, and uh, it was just an amazing thing. 
And once you come to faith in Jesus Christ, you, you express it by plunging your past in baptism. So here's how I want to close my segment with you today. I'd like to ask you to bow your head with me right now. And it could be today that you've been exploring, you've been investigating, and you're ready to RSVP to God's love and God's grace. And so this is your moment right now. You could just do that. And, and maybe just now, while everybody's got their heads bowed and eyes closed, you just kind of quietly pray to God and you just say, just say, silently, just say, God, I realize today I've made mistakes. I've hurt you. I've hurt people. I've sinned. And I know I need you in my life. And then just say you're sorry. Just say, God, I am so sorry I've hurt you. I'm so sorry I've hurt other people. And I want to walk in a new direction, but I can't do it in my own strength, and I can't do it in my own power. I need you in my life. I need your grace. And if you're recognizing your need and saying you're sorry, maybe right now you'll just verbalize, confess your faith to God, and just say, God, today I confess to you Jesus is Lord. And I believe in my heart that you raised him from the dead. And he is alive so that I can be alive. He died for me so that I can live for you. And today I put my faith in him. You know, if you're doing that today and you're putting your faith in him, I want you to know Jesus said, if you will confess me before other people, I will confess you before the Father. And so I want to invite you today to confess your faith to me in a moment. And uh, everybody else has their heads bowed and their eyes closed, but if you want to confess your faith to me today, in a moment I'm just going to count to three and I'm going to ask you to just slip your hand up. And I know that's going to take courage to do and that may sound unimportant, but I know what's going to happen when you get out of here today. The evil one's going to whisper in your ear, did you really receive Jesus today? Did you really make that decision? And something's going to solidify in your heart when you express it, when you put your hand up in the air and say, yes, today, today, I RSVP to God's love. So if you've made this decision today in the room, again, just everybody keep your heads bowed and eyes closed, but I'm just going to ask you to, when I count to three, if you've made this decision, raise your hand and keep it up long enough that I can see it, okay? And just acknowledge that decision in your life, okay? So one, two, three. Anybody make this decision today? Just put your hand up. Awesome. Just keep it up. for me. That's tremendous. Okay, you can put your hands down. Congratulations. Nine people in this room just made the most important expression of their life, putting their faith in Jesus Christ today. Rejoice with you. And I hope you'll now that you've RSV'd that you will plunge your past in baptism. And you can do that anytime. Our team can help you with that. Just let us know. Well, God, I thank you for the privilege of being a part of these moments today. I thank you for these people. Thank you for the fact that you're stirring something in their life that they obviously are on a spiritual journey and they all want to take next steps. And I just pray that you'll lead all of us to what that next step is. I pray that many in this room today would be open to the first step experience, God, and what you want to do there. And whether it's in a connection group or serving or other ways, may we always be open to just engaging with you and your activity in our lives. And God, I especially thank you today for these people who just made the most courageous decision of their life and who said yes to Jesus Christ, who confessed him to you, who acknowledged him to me. And, and God, I just pray that they'll have the courage now to express it in baptism, to do what Thousands of us at Eastside have done and just express our faith in baptism, identifying with the death and burial and resurrection of your son. And just as the angels in heaven are rejoicing with their decision, we're rejoicing with their decision today too, God. And we lift all of our prayers now in your amazing, extraordinary son's name, Jesus Christ. And everybody said, amen. amen. Well, as you heard me pray a moment ago, there were nine people in this room today that just shot up their hand and said, I want Jesus, and we celebrate with you. We congratulate you, and uh, I want to thank you again for the privilege of just hanging out today and being with all of you, and I'm going to ask Greg to come up, and he's going to give some uh, instructions here, tell you a little bit about the First Step experience. So take it away, Greg.
Let's give Gene a big hand. Thanks for sharing with us, as always. Okay, well, I'm here to kind of talk about this whole uh, first step experience thing. Before I do, I'm going to have your table host, w which they've done a great job visiting with you, haven't they? They are the welcome wagons here. And uh, yeah, they're worth, they're worth a little encouragement. They're going to hand out the colored sheet that looks like this to you. And I want you to take a look at it beginning at the bottom, the bottom. For many of you, especially some of you who just raise your hands to make that choice to RSVP to God, your next step literally is baptism. And so at the bottom, if you're a person who just knows that you've been wanting to be baptized for a long time, or this is all fresh for you, or you're not sure if you want to get baptized yet, you want to learn more, you have some questions, or you want to schedule it, whatever, in the corner chewing his food is Jim Sweeney. He is all things baptism here at Eastside. And he's going to be available over there, I guess, behind the food. You're going to separate yourself from the food? You do know, you do know there's no food there. Okay, just making sure. He'll, he'll be over there um, available for, to answer your questions about baptism because they could be many and scheduling and all that kind of stuff. Moving up the sheet now to the middle. Every one of us, as Gene pointed out, if we do not need one of those groups at Friday Night of Hope, every one of us could probably f at least name three or four people in their lives who could use one of those. Every one of us. You are a conduit of God's grace when you can help plug people who have need into resources that will meet that need. And if you have questions about Friday Night of Hope, again, Greg Arbris will be standing by his display over there, Friday Night of Hope. Please beeline when we're done over to him and ask all the questions you want about these ministries because you could change a person's life and bring much healing through them. Now, on the top, we have the All Access Tour. Now, this is an incredible event. Julie, who you met earlier that uh, Jean pointed out, is going to be behind that kiosk on your way out. She can answer your questions about the All Access Tour, the next one being April 6th. But I'm here to tell you is that you have not experienced what goes on on this campus during a service till during a service, you, while it's going on, you go into the green room. You go behind that huge television set, <laughs> screen, and see it during a service, and see the stuff. You go to the kids' area, the Compassion Cafe. You go and you s in the teen service, and you see uh, the parking lot where everybody, how it's all happening during a service. And you get to have conversations, see how, well, how God has made you uniquely can, can further what's going on here because there's so many opportunities to serve and make a difference. And that All Access Tour exposes you. But here's the good news. If you become part of the First Step experience, that is part of the fifth week is you get your own special private tour. So you don't have to sign up for that apart. It's an incredible thing. But don't listen to me talk about the First Step experience. I'd like you to hear from people some of them may be your table host, who knows, who might be telling you a little bit about how they encountered the First Step experience. When I first came to Eastside, I was a little overwhelmed with how large the campus was. I was also really impressed with how genuinely friendly and welcoming everyone was. I could really tell they were really happy for that I was here, just to be here. When I first came to Eastside, I was amazed. I was amazed by the campus, and I was amazed by the way God had led me here. Most services, I find myself crying because God's word speaks right to my heart. When I first came to Eastside, I did not believe in God. Some, some of the new thoughts and um, experiences that, that have come into my life are um, almost all centered around um, serving. I, I found that, um, that that's what I want to do, that's what I need to do. Well, I think my biggest moment in First Step was with Pastor Greg, and he said something where he was talking about the difference between a Christ follower and a Christian. Since coming to First Step and uh, coming to Eastside, my life has, um, has completely changed. I feel fulfilled, and I, I know a lot of it has to do with what's being done here, and it all started at First Step. It all started at First Step. It all started with First Step. It all started at First Step. I try to tell everybody, and I will continue to tell everybody, that that First Step is where you want to be. <sighs> Definitely. <laughs> Oh, 
Okay, so to explain to you a little bit about what goes on in the first step experience, um, turn your, your little sheet that you got handed over. There are seven areas of following Jesus that we do training in, and, they, and also this, this thing also answers those questions that are listed at the bottom. In order to give you a f more fully ordered picture of what these seven weeks in the first step experience is like, I want to I do a little survey. Raise your hand if you have ever heard of the Grand Canyon. You've heard of it. Okay, most of us. All right. Raise your hand if you have ever been to the Grand Canyon. See it with your own eyes. Okay, about 80% of those who raised their hand the first time. Raise your hand if you've ever whitewater rafted it. <laughs> I always love that. Yeah, about four of us. That's pretty good. Usually I'm the only one. Now I'm telling you, the first step experience, in fact, I'll just say, forget the first step experience. Your experience with God is much like your encounter with the Grand Canyon. Let me explain. Most everybody here would probably say that they believe in a God or they believe uh, in Jesus, maybe even believe that he's the son of God, or maybe even believe he died for their sins. That's like knowing that there is a Grand Canyon, okay? Now, the devil also believes all of that, too. He knows that Jesus is the son of God and died for your sins as well. So congratulations. If we've reached that point, we're now all up to devil level, <laughs> okay? But... For those of you who have ever actually been to the Grand Canyon, you know it's a completely different experience. That's the way it is when you move from hearing that there's a Jesus to encountering him for the first time. It's two very different things. And when you encounter him on a personal level, you're, you're never the same. You're never the same. And uh, for those of you who've had that experience, you know exactly what I'm talking about. But again, even Satan himself has encountered Jesus personally. What Jesus did is he went through uh, uh, the crowds in the first century, and his invitation wasn't just believe I exist or even believe that I've died for your sins. He had two, a two-word invitation. Follow me. Follow me. I want you to invest in following me. He took people even in a shift in their time commitments, whatever, and they spent three years with them. And he taught them some things. He trained them in some things. Basically, that's like those who end up whitewater rafting the Grand Canyon and see it from the bottom up. When you've done that, you can see the canyon and, the, and little waterfalls and wildlife and the different colors and how the sun hits them. You end up experiencing something if you've whitewater rafted it that, that few people ever experience. And that's what Jesus wants you to experience with God. And it starts by you accepting the invitation to follow him. So that's why we do training in how to follow him. And I'm saying training because I'm not going to be just like your teacher for the first step experience. I will be like a coach. You will get assignments. You come back and you share about those assignments that are based on these training. But this whole thing is built around three factors in the first step experience. Faith, fun, and friends. This is how this happens. The faith part will come from me and the training that we're giving is outlined here. The friend part comes from the fact that based on what you would fill out in a moment if you sign up for the First Step Experience, we will place you at tables with people in the same life stage and near the same zip code, okay? So you could get to know people that you have some maybe some access, access to geographically at some commonality and life stage. You know, we'll have like a college student table or a young marriage table or an empty nester's table or a married with kids or, you know what I mean, we have all kinds of tables that we put together there. Uh, to come together, and then the fun factor is built on the fact that with the training, a couple things with the training, because it's follow me and it's training, we give you a backpack week one. Everybody gets a first step backpack. Second week and the rest of the weeks, we give you an object for that backpack that ties in and is useful for the training. And then we have competitions every week that kind of enhance the training, and the competitions almost get bloody. Some of you tables just go nuts. These first steppers are unruly people. And the the competitions end up with, if one person at that table wins, the whole table wins. And when we say win, we're talking they get dinners out, they get movie tickets, they get coffee mugs, they get stuff at the Compassion Cafe, they get, like, they get good gifts, okay? And they'll fight for those gifts, man. But it's to, I guarantee you that if you come into this first step experience, you will experience faith, 
and training in it. You'll experience fun, and you will have friends here at Eastside. And in seven weeks, man, the relationships built. Sometimes those tables end up sometimes actually becoming, when it's done, a connection group of their own. And it's just built in. It's absolutely awesome. So you could see uh, that the dates, in fact, I'm looking at old dates, but I hopefully you have current dates. And yes, you do. It actually starts next week. It starts next weekend. So I know that that's soon, but if you can make a minimum of six of those seven, I'd invite you to sign up. If you can't, there's some other things that you could do that your table host could fill you on. Uh, we have another run on Memorial Weekend beginning, but I'm telling you what, if you jump into this, this is going to be, this is going to loft your, not just your spiritual journey, but can just send raising your uh, experience here at Eastside tenfold. So here's what I would actually like to do as we talk about the first step experience here. I'd like you to know, first off, the number one misconception about it is that it's a new person's class. Like it's new, like if you don't know much about the Bible. Uh, you need to know that it is, it, even though it covers all those bases, it goes to a depth that uh, staff from other churches will send their staff here just to get refreshed by it. It's got that kind of content. And so we do those things that literally, no matter where you're at on that little line that Jesus wrote, it's going to speak into you and train you up in some significant ways that I guarantee you've not been exposed to. Okay? So what I want you to do is I would invite your table host to pass out the second sheet. And the second sheet is a, is a registration form, and I'd like you to fill out most of it, even if you can't register for the First Step experience today. What's on it is it gives us some life stage information about you, a contact info, and I, I just want to invite you, if you're comfortable with sharing that with us, even if you don't go to First Step experience, it will help us serve you better to know these things about you, okay? Now, at the bottom, it'll say First Step experience, yes or no, and you could just Put yes or no, and if it's yes, you can say, am I going to come during the, the, the Saturday service or during the first service on Sunday, okay? And what we'll do is, based on your information, we'll form the table, so it's very important that you really mean it, because we're going to form tables around this, right? And uh, what I want you to do is to just take uh, a moment, I'm going to give you a minute, okay, to ask some questions of your table host about it, if you have any, and to check your calendar to see if this is the round that you could do, and hopefully it is. And just have some conversations about some of the options or variables that may be going on with you. So why don't you go ahead and do that for about a minute. Father, we just thank you so much for the chance to be together today and to, to have the sense that of knowing that it's no accident that our paths have crossed today. So Lord, may the purpose for which you brought us here be fulfilled. May it cause you to smile and may we sense that the reason you made us, much less let us here, is slowly unfolding and being fulfilled as we take our first steps together. In Christ's name, we all said, Amen. thank you for coming. Glad you were here.